l'oro che fece risplendere l'Egitto del Nuovo Regno. Questo è il titolo del dialogo al quale state per assistere e che si inquadra nella più ampia iniziativa Aspettando Biennale Tecnologia 2024. Questo dialogo è stato realizzato in collaborazione tra il Politecnico di Torino e il Museo Egizio di Torino e a questo proposito desidero ringraziare sentitamente il direttore del Museo Egizio, il dottor Christian Greco, per la sua preziosa collaborazione. I due relatori ci accompagneranno a comprendere come l'oro ha svolto un ruolo primordiale nello sviluppo della civiltà egizia, a partire da come veniva estratto, poi trasformato, e quindi il suo impatto sulla economia e sulla società di questa grande civiltà. Quindi verrà aperta una interessante e coinvolgente finestra sul passato, ma che ci porterà anche a riflettere su quello che è il nostro presente, perché ancora oggi le materie prime hanno un'influenza importantissima sull'economia, sulle società, e su quelli che sono gli equilibri geopolitici del mondo. I due relatori che ci accompagnano in questo percorso sono due personalità di alto profilo, il dottor Johannes Aue Müller, che è curatore del Museo Egizio dal 2020 e che insieme a numerose altre expertise ha anche un'esperienza profonda nella lavorazione nei metalli e nella fusione del bronzo nel periodo faraonico. E l'altro relatore è il professor Alessandro Giraudo, che è docente presso due grandes écoles parigine, economista, e autore di libri notissimi sulle materie prime, sulla loro storia e sul loro impatto sull'economia e sulle società. Nel ringraziare i due relatori per il loro prezioso contributo e tutti voi per il vostro interesse ed attenzione, vi auguro una buona visione. Ok, so it's a great pleasure to be here with you all and particularly with you, Alessandro Giraudo, to speak about the topic that you see behind us here on the screen. Um, we are going to talk in English, but this is uh, in Italian, but if I may translate it, we are talking about the gold that made the splendor or, or that made Egypt um, splendor in the, the New Kingdom. Right. So, you know, um, it is a very special moment for Egypt because, you know, for a long time, um, Egypt was a, a very important uh, dynasty, set of dynasties and, uh, and um, a, an important power. But um, as of the beginning of the 18th dynasty, they were able to had, have a couple of very important uh, expansion activity, so military activity, and they were able to occupy the region south of Egypt, that means uh, Nubia. And uh, for your information, as you know, Nubia means, uh, Nub means gold in uh, local, uh, local language. And uh, this means... Yeah, I might, in this case, indeed you, have something to, something to in immediately oh, okay. to discuss, because this <laughs> is indeed a very important um, topic. Sure, sure. Um, in the literature, one often finds the equation that, that the toponym mm -hmm. Nubia derives from the ancient Egyptian word Nub, Nub right. which stands for gold. In, but the, our pronunciation of the word Nub is more or less wrong because in ancient Egyptian it was pronounced Nebu. Nebu. And there are re more recent studies mm -hmm. of, let's say, linguists who think that the term Nubia has etymologically nothing to do with gold, with gold. Mm -hmm. but it's only the local ethnonym of people who spoke a Nubian language, namely Nobiin, mm -hmm. and they use the term Nob for their self-identification. So Nob means the Nubian, but the link with gold has recently been disputed, but mm. in the literature it's found over and over again and repeated sure. because this, this relationship seems so obvious, mm -hmm. but in the end it might not it be might not as be. we and as I we would believe. like to counter-attack so. you, yeah. <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, probably you know that um, all the people that were uh, working the gold, so not miners, but uh, um, people that were goldsmiths in reality, mm -hmm. and they were called the Nubi. Nebiu. Oh, Nebiu. Mm -hmm. Sorry, so sorry for Nebi my pronunciation. And the, you know, uh, there is indeed also a very interesting hierarchy 
among the mm -hmm. um, goldsmith or the gold workers. So there is one group of persons that are called simply Nebio, Nebio gold workers. Right. Mm -hmm. Then we have another hierarchy level, Harry Nebio, so the um, um, chiefs of the gold workers. And then we have even Imi Ra Nebio, meaning mm -hmm. overseers of the Nebio. So and this the is top, an top, imp, top, imp, top. interesting fact that particularly also in this mm -hmm. context of the specialists, that were able to process all the gold that was sourced in the mines along the so. eastern desert, or particularly also in ancient Nubia in two larger regions, mm -hmm. um, that there is a certain hierarchy among those craftspeople. I understand. Great. And so, you know, the gold uh, was uh, a very important element for the growth uh, and development of the dynasty, and uh, Egypt had to import quite a lot of goods because, you know, it was a very rich country, but they were missing some important elements like uh, spices, for example, uh, some uh, mordants that were utilized for, for the, the classic um, fabric, uh, some horses for the, the cavalry, very, very important. And um, as we mentioned before, um, for the, the wood, because Egypt has a little bit of wood, but you know, the top quality uh, was imported first, second, the wood uh, that was utilized by the navy, either the military navy and uh, the, the commercial fleet, uh, had to be imported mainly from Lebanon, from uh, a classic, classic area. In fact, uh, we can remember that even during the Ottoman period, they had always the same problem, so they had to import uh, uh, wood from uh, uh, either from uh, the, the regions uh, north of Greece or uh, from Africa, mm -hmm. because uh, all the uh, Ottoman yeah. Empire had the same problem. And the same is also for the Romans. They had to import from the northern uh, regions uh, of Europe, and um, it is a, a determinant factor for, for the power. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, uh, clearly uh, gold uh, was utilized to, to buy the sympathy, call it like this, of uh, some populations, uh, or in other cases, uh, really uh, to finance uh, the real war, the activity. So it means uh, gold that was uh, utilized to, to pay uh, mercenaries uh, fighting in two regions where the Egyptian Egyptian uh, dynasty uh, had a big development. That is the west, the eastern part of Libya and the, the Levantine area. Uh, that is. Uh, around Israel, just to, to make, uh, make uh, oh, yeah. in fact, you know, by sure you are going to mention Megiddo, that is an important... Uh, the Battle of Megiddo uh, by Battle Tripos of Megiddo. III. Yeah. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I just want to also, for our visitors, a little bit come back to what we, what the New Kingdom is. Here we are talking about the time between 1550 to 1070 BC, and um, we Egyptologists are also then used to subdivide this um, period into uh, three dynasties, the 18th, the 19th, and the, the 20th, 20th dynasty. And um, Alessandro also mentioned already the Battle of Megiddo, so one um, key military event um, under Tutmosis III. Right. And um, this is then indeed part of this uh, military expansion of the Egyptian state towards the north in order to um, yeah, get also into contact or get access to all the um, um, also prestige goods prestige, and right. um, also other resources um, available in this region. And the same then more or less applies uh, in the south, so the region of Nubia, which is the larger region along the Nile, south of modern Aswan, where um, also the uh, first kings of the uh, Egyptians' 18th dynasty started with a number of military campaigns, uh, one after the other to um, one after the other, more or less, territorialize and um, colonialize this. And getting one uh, cataract this, after this the other, up to, up to the landscape. fifth cataract, yes, yes, that yes, is yes, very, yes. very important. And indeed, particularly the area of Nubia is mm -hmm. the one which is one central um, landscape um, that is known for gold. But um, speaking of gold, one also needs to consider always that in Egypt itself, so along the eastern um, desert, in the eastern desert hills, there is also um, there are um, well-known um, huge uh, concentrations of um, Egyptian gold mining sites. So, speaking of gold, then indeed the eastern desert regions and two regions um, in ancient Nubia were the main main uh, sourcing areas for this gold. Right. And I might also uh, just briefly uh, add 
um, another um, element that gold indeed played a key role for the development and the splendor and the military might and power of the new kingdom, but um, also as economists and um, social anthropologists, we should never forget also the role of the, the backbone of Egyptian economy, which is the agriculture. And this is indeed the factor that allowed also Egypt and the new kingdom to create all the resources, to create all the manpower, to have all these um, needed things, both in terms of people, of craftspeople who would build and make um, all these military paraphernalia. And what we know, at least from Egyptian documents and the evidence, is that grain is also among the main means of currency or sure. payment. So gold is indeed one element that um, plays a role in state context, in the elite sphere, as a means of showing off of the state presenting itself, of the state. So a marketing um, of the image. A market, but also within Egypt, that you know, in interior, order to, in, right. in, to furnish the temples with golden doors or gold uh, right. doors cast. In fact, as you know, um, the gold was a product, this destiny, this to, that was with a destiny for, for the pharaoh. Yes, because as we know, all resources right. in terms of natural resources and of um, mi mineral resources in Egyptian state ideology belonged to Pharaoh. So, so he property, is the key right. key player in this, and, and he an had owner, then, an owner. Yes, also. he then had his agents that were in the individual regions in charge mm. of the sourcing and all the. Um, the planning of either proper state-run expeditions into the Nubian, re uh, into the gold-bearing regions in order to uh, mine the gold, or also in more informal ways that sure. um, people that are li that were living in this region, also nomads that were knowledgeable about the areas or that were also knowledgeable about the technologies, how to extract gold from these quartz, right. um, how they, how the Egyptian state in the end could make use of all this and how in the end a huge part of the gold that was produced was indeed flowing into the uh, into the Egyptian treasury. Treasuries, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Indeed, yeah, yeah. And you know something that I, I guess that we need to, to be a little bit more precise, um, the gold had two origins. One was a classic mine, so the quartz, <laughs> and people were just uh, uh, taking out the, the stones, breaking the stones, and after treating the gold with the water, etc. And the second, uh, the second important uh, source of gold was the alluvial mm -hmm. gold. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. means something that you find. Uh, so we, we may think of the of the uh, the miners in California in mm -hmm. 18, for 1849 that were just uh, collecting gold, uh, yeah. or even in in Africa, the western part of yeah. Africa, yeah. where the the gold is is. Uh, is not a dig. It's not dug. Mm -hmm. It is. It is gold that, that is uh, um, just collected by by this yeah. kind of yeah. and uh, something that I would like to, to remind you. Remember that we have uh, the Jason, um, the the golden fleece. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You anticipated me. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, as you know, it was one of the technique because mm -hmm. they were putting all this kind of uh, of animal um, hide uh, skin, hide yeah, sheep skin, particularly the sheep's yeah. mainly. Mm -hmm collecting uh, in the water all the gold, putting the, this kind of, of very important uh, element uh, to the sun, so it was bright, and after they were burning this kind of, of very important uh, collector of gold mm -hmm. and getting out the, the, the yeah, gold. And yeah, so, yeah. you know, when we think of uh, the Jason and, and all the mythology around, it is something that is, it is true in the region mm -hmm. where he was, uh, is, uh, he had his experience, is a still a very important, right, even right now, region mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. gold mining. Mm -hmm. And um, so quite a lot of, of mythology, it is mm -hmm. not only invention of the human being, but it is a transformation of, of the reality. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, something I would like to, to remind is uh, that we have, um, I'm just taking my notes, um, we had a period uh, uh, that started with the Coptos uh, gold. It was really called, uh, called uh, mm -hmm, Coptos mm -hmm. gold, so on the northern part Nebu of Egypt. Nebu and you. Yes, mm -hmm, absolutely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. After the Vanat, Wanat maybe, uh, and the last part is the Kush, that is the... Ah, the gold the of Coptos, the gold of Wawat, and Wawad, the gold of I, Kush. Of sorry Kush. for, yes, it, no, no, for the pronunciation. Is, 
That's why I'm here as the Egyptologist, exactly. so to uh, <laughs> support and, uh, and so, you know, um, we had the three phases that are very, very important. And as soon, uh, um, and we are already in the 19th dynasty, the cash, cash uh, was uh, partially abandoned. They had some some troubles because this is a bit also debated because debate, I know. since now in the last um, 15 years the archaeology of Nubia has properly picked up thanks to a um, particular in Sudan mm -hmm. which is um, now the modern state in which uh, lots of ancient Nubia is um, located thanks to a number of international funding projects and whereas in the 50s 60s 70s we didn't really know that much about the later mm -hmm. new kingdom so indeed the, the 19th dynasty sure. and particularly 20th dynasty um, in Sudan there was the idea of the depopulation of this region which is not not, totally true. not the current understanding mm -hmm. but we also need to think also in archaeology we, we we think in particular epistemes so there is a number of there are waves of thinking and based on the different available types of evidence we as archaeologists or cultural historians um, sure. create uh, an image or our understanding current understanding about about these regions so we know a little bit more now also about the let's say demographic um, Evolution. reality let's sure. say of um, Nubia particularly in the later um, Ramesside period so the uh, later 20th dynasty and was not um, depopulated but what we know also let's say we don't have that much archaeological and epigraphical evidence. evidence this is maybe more the methodological issue that in this period those people living there decorating the temples being buried leaving texts and other information don't really focus on on their jobs on their daily routine of what they were what kind of jobs they had because in this period they followed a different kind of mindset and understanding mm -hmm. whereas in the 18th dynasty in Egypt it was key for an elite person to boast and show off in, in, in his tomb who he was and which kind of relationship he was with the king, what his kind of economic uh, standing was. Really and political marketing and it's, reality. it's then a different, different, different kind of, of time. Um, you mentioned an amazing um, thing, namely the Golden Fleece, and in order to provide also a bit of historical context, it indeed seems that the first gold sourcing activities were just gold finding Collection. in the alluvial gold. Exactly. Alluvial. Yes. What is interesting, this is something that I was asking myself, also looking at the material culture, so the objects that were used for this, I don't know of any kind of gold panning pen for this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. No one among my colleagues that are specialized in Mention ceramics this. Sure. mentioned this. I wonder if this kind of panic panning technique would have been really used we should know what kind of ceramic vessels were used so i completely understand the the, the point and i also am sure that this was let's say the initial part of of sourcing gold but on the other hand we still are lacking so much information about it then on the other hand you mentioned also the the proper quartz veins that right. were um um, um, followed and obviously this was a technique that was then mainly developed in the so-called Old and Middle Kingdom also using dolerite hammers and following um, geological indications because the ancient Egyptians had people that they called cementio prospectors hmm. so people that were knowledgeable also about the local geology particularly in, in the eastern desert they were roaming the land and were really trying to find all the proper gold bearing quartz veins and also did some tests and surveys and when they seemed to be uh, promising they then triggered the whole creation of an Egyptian state-run mm. expedition um, to work on these and then next to the alluvial gold or the placer gold and the uh, quartz vein gold it seems that particularly also in ancient Nubia another methodology was used which has been called wadi workings mm -hmm. which is also something that is faster and easier and doable by a larger workforce therefore maybe also the increase in gold production in the new kingdom because this is a technology of gold sourcing particularly known from this period which means that along the wadi ground so the dried out um, riverbeds in the desert all the quartz and all the eroded um, stone that was eroded through the millennia from the surrounding sure. rock 
um, um, collected and on the ground, and then the Egyptians just, let's say, walked over these, picked up the quartz-bearing mm -hmm. larger pieces or smaller ones, and then could process them easier while not doing all this hard labor so in, with, in, with the hammers, in, in the proper mine in the right. hammer. So it's, it's indeed also mm. possible that particular um, mining approaches lead to a particular increase also in gold production, which we then see in the New Kingdom, and which then allows New Kingdom, Egypt of the New Kingdom, to receive to all, all this. Have a strong benefits, a benefit. Yeah, to, sure. to receive all this gold as a proper state organized income, on the one hand. On the other hand, as tributes by those people living there, so as, sure. as also political gifts. Um, you are now under the control of Egypt, meaning you need to pay us taxes, pay no? taxes. Right, exactly. and then also, as I already mentioned, through maybe more informal market ways, because we mm. are also not sure what kind of private market or trade barter exchange um, really did ha happen in the New Kingdom and which other ways of gold, um, the gold might have been tackled through, um, through these or from these regions Sure. via informal trade networks into the hands of the Egyptians. Right, and you know, I'm thinking now, uh, maybe uh, we could talk about uh, the silver and gold ratio, because you know, uh, Egypt has a small quantity, had a, qu a small quantity of silver, that was uh, in reality the normal way to trade uh, quite a lot of goods. You mentioned gold as an important image of gold, uh, copper, clearly, mm -hmm. uh, bronze, and silver, well, yeah. like like in the structure of the of the um, the currency um, method of payment, and um, it is important because you know a lot of silver had to be imported. Mm -hmm. Some of the gold was containing some silver, so it was uh, taken out of the mm -hmm. gold. Mm -hmm. But a lot of gold or silver had to be imported. And uh, the silver at that time was coming mainly from from the mines in uh, in Spain. Mm -hmm. This and is so, you know, interesting. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I know that, for example, uh, the Phoenician uh, merchants mm -hmm. much later yeah, okay. were mm -hmm. uh, this is the point mm -hmm. uh, were used to buy uh, silver in Spain and a certain kind of price and selling the same silver getting much more gold because at uh, one point the ratio gold to silver was uh, one ounce of silver per one ounce or two ounces of gold. That is incredible. While the region in Mesopotamia there has a large amount um, of uh, silver in the Iran uh, mines mm -hmm. right now, so in Persian uh, uh, mining uh, area, they had a lot of, of silver, so the prices there were something like one ounce of gold per 10, 12 um, ounces of silver. Mm -hmm. So it was a very profitable business. And uh, this is important to keep in mind because it means that um, at that time the trading was a, a very important element, but not like right now. No, right now, for example, if you can see in the market uh, a big difference like this, uh, you click uh, on your computer and you buy this and you sell that. At that time, it was much more difficult and also the transportation was much, much longer. So it means that uh, it was um, uh, an important element, but not for big, big volumes and big size. But uh, slowly, uh, the silver came to Egypt and so the ratio changed very rapidly, to one to one, and after it was one to two, exactly, exactly on the other side. One to one, or it, I also read also a little bit in preparation that um, there was even some colleagues said that indeed there are, no, but we can maybe speak later also about the, um, the, the particular gold qualities that we know, because there are more or less three kind of qualities. Sure. Um, but I wanted to uh, simply come back to the silver and um, your um, mentioning of the um, origin in Spain. But this is then not something that um, we can in any way securely relate no, to our to time. that time. No. It is, in okay. fact, I said okay. later. Okay, okay. okay. later. Very yeah, important. Yeah. Because when we talk about silver in Egypt, then it seems that most of the Egyptian silver is actually a natural alloy 
of silver and gold. Of silver and gold, make sure, right, exactly. So the type of gold that was sourced was not always gold, but sometimes had indeed more um, ratio of silver and right. was then, and let's was, say... It was whiter. Much it was whiter, whiter indeed, exactly. and this is then something that In we fact, are coming... You know, but you know me, uh, that we had uh, the first... Uh, uh, coin that was traded in uh, northern part of uh, uh, near near uh, near Tr Troy was a mixture of, of the two mm -hmm. yeah yeah and which uh, is then also another let's say metallurgical thing that we are used to call right. electrum elect in fact also i'm talking the about the electrum uh, right of, exactly. of gold but natural gold and natural and uh, mm -hmm. mixture of the two mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely because it seems that all the silver that was sourced in the eastern desert and Nubia was indeed coming from the Egyptian gold mines. Mm -hmm. And there are colleagues who um, don't really want to call it silver, but they want to call it Aurian silver. Mm -hmm. Aurian silver. Aurian, sure. So indeed, next to the silver coming from gold mines, there also might be a little bit of more, I, I don't want to say pure silver, but let's say silver with the indeed um, higher content of silver in, con, um, in connection to um, other elements such as gold. But um, it might also be possible that also lead ores such as galena, mm -hmm. galena. were then also um, um, treated in order to extract the minute amounts of silver in the, in the lead, in the galena. However, it seems that um, the silver contents in this galena at least from our modern perspective, don't seem to be high enough for a successful or also economically mm -hmm. viable, viable. Um, um, undertaking. Mentioning silver, obviously, a key find is the Etot treasure. Right. So if we talk about silver, we just need to mention Mechanically, this. So, <laughs> we, um, we fold there. Um, uh, you know, a selection of silver objects that were cached or ritually buried in a temple of Etot in Egypt to hide them away. And it seems indeed that most of the silver, if we understand the um, methods of um, provenancing, right, comes from Syria. So has this mm. um, um, origin from Syria. But anyway, um, silver was in the Old and Middle Kingdom also far more exceptional and rare. But it seems that in the New Kingdom, so the time that we are talking about, um, it's not so such an exceptional material because we know that, for instance, in Ramesside times, Ramses III, he offers, or he is, there are texts that speak of um, um, several hundred kilograms of silver statuary in temples. So mm -hmm. there must have been a huge number of um, cult statues made in silver in those temples, which obviously did not survive right. um, until today. So also here we are always... Um, we need to rely on these sources. Then in silver, also the Bubastis treasure, another find of um, famous silver vessels from the late New Kingdom. Here we are really talking 19th dynasty, 20th dynasty, so, also with the, the, with moment, with yeah. the connection fi found in the Egyptian Nile Delta with this kind of international style and trade. So it's a wonderful um, find. And then if we even go on later, in the 21st dynasty, so the kings of Tani, so the Psusenna sarcophagus fully made in silver. So we have then also um, lots of objects um, in silver. And me as a curator at the Museo Izizzo, I'm also currently working on the um, copper alloy uh, metal vessels from the tomb of Ha, so from the, mm -hmm. um, the tomb TT8 that was found undisturbed by Nestor Caparelli in 19. Um, or six, there is a huge set of copper alloy vessels for drinking and for cooking and for other things, but among them also three silver vessels, which then obviously stand out, but um, don't maybe create such an, such an extraordinary value as we might think. Mm. But this is again always the question, which kind of evidence, meaning epigraphical evidence, so what kind of original sure. Egyptian texts we read and how we are going to um, read them and interpret them um, in, um, yeah, and what kind of different questions we have right, in them, right. obviously. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, um, I think really more and more that the gold uh, played an important role for uh, this kind of dynasty 
and I have found uh, some, uh, some statistics about uh, the um, annual production mm -hmm. that is estimated up to 1,000 kilos. So it seems uh, a small quantity. But keep in mind that right now we have a mining production of roughly two, two and a half uh, uh, thousand uh, tons, I'm talking tons right now, of, of gold worldwide. worldwide. Okay, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, something that we really we need to keep in mind, um, the, the ratio, uh, so the, the, the quantity of gold that people are right now extracting mm -hmm. from one ton of, yeah. uh, of mineral, it is between four and five grams per one ton. Mm -hmm. Incredible. You mean one ton of quartz, one ton of rock, one and ton then of the right. exactly. resulting... Exactly. Mm. And uh, in Australia, they are able to work, and this is incredible, at half a gram per ton. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they are making money because, mm -hmm. you know, they are trading gold at around $1,900, and uh, they are producing at 17 18 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it is a very profitable business. Also economically viable, viable in, this, exactly. in this. But okay. keep in mind, yeah. half a gram is incredible. Yeah. But keep in mind also that, for example, right now, in the case of copper, um, people are trading, are producing copper with a ratio of uh, something like four kilos per ton. Mm -hmm. So it is not a tremendous amount. Yeah. And uh, um, 20, 30 years ago, this kind of grade, that is the technical word, grade, mm -hmm. was in the region of seven to eight. Okay. The same for, for mm -hmm. gold, mm -hmm. seven to eight, mm -hmm. um, something like in 1980-ish, um, the level was in the region of real seven to eight, and now has been cut by two, really cut mm -hmm. into parts. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is uh, something that we need to, 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 to keep we in mind. We need to keep in mind, Absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, exactly. Speaking about these numbers, and returning to the New Kingdom, sure. so there are wonderful, um, and there's a wonderful um, document, the so-called Annals of Tutmosis III, mm -hmm. that are carved in the Karnak Temple, and that record the individual yearly tributes that were um, tributed by the surrounding countries to Egypt under the reign of Tutmosis III. And there is one particular in the later years, so the years between 34 and 42 in his reign, mm -hmm. we have information about the yearly tribute coming from both Wawad, so meaning Lower True, Nubia, lower. and also Kush, meaning Kush. Upper Nubia. Upper. So this might be then interesting to um, put um, this into context and also to provide, let's say, a general understanding how much gold was in this, um, was within one year uh, mined and sourced and delivered to the treasury of the state, meaning the pharaoh. And these numbers range between 220 and 280 kilograms per year Very for good. Wawad. Um, and for Kush, it's between 9 kilograms to 27 mm -hmm. per year, which is quite a lot, but also not that much. And these are then some numbers that we archaeologists and economists need to um, take into consideration when we want to estimate um, the, um, the general gold production, because this is, let's say, only right. what the Egyptian state um, was able to receive or, or, or get, um, get um, as an income of tributes. Because on the other hand, we know that the Egyptian um, pharaohs spent far more gold than they received from those quarries or that are listed mm -hmm. in those texts for their own temples. We know, for instance, that Hatshepsut um, donates 4,000 um, kilograms of mm -hmm. gold to the Temple of Amun. To Moses III, to the Amun Temple of Karnak as well, 13,000 kilograms. Um, Amenhotep III, so the father of Echnaton and one of no, those right. kings of the New Kingdom, who's also in most cases always connected with the peak of um, splendor or, in the New dynasty. Kingdom. Mm -hmm. There is one inscription that says that he um, gifted or donated 5,157 kilograms of gold mm. to the Temple of Mont. So there is intense um, use of gold within Egypt for furnishing the temples, 
which can be gilding doors, which can be statues of gold, which can be cult paraphernalia in gold, which can be statues of the king himself, mm -hmm. also gilt or gold, um, or in gold, or other kind of elements of the, let's say, the, the monumental display of those Symbol things. Symbol of power. Right. Yeah, in, in, indeed showing off. So. And then on the other hand, um, we have Ramses III, and we are then in the 20th dynasty, but he still donates 4,600 kilograms of gold mm -hmm. to various temples. So there is still gold available. And this is then also something that um, we might add to the discussion. On the one hand, um, new gold from the Eastern Desert and from the two regions in Nubia is coming in, and also f as tributes from Syria, because also we know coming after from, the Megiddo yeah, battle, right. um, also lots of gold has been um, gifted to Egypt in form of tribute to Tutmosis III. That next to this, let's say, newly incoming sourced gold with proper state-run expeditions and state-run undertakings, that there's also lots of gold that is in circulation from all the gold-rich periods before. Sure, the so gold the is new stable. kingdom is also, let's say, riding on the wave of gold availability mm -hmm. um, from gold available in Old Kingdom context and in uh, Middle Kingdom context and later. And I have just a, a question that is uh, um, the temple, mm -hmm. Temples, mm -hmm. probably, mm -hmm. had uh, a lot of gold. Yes. And uh, what was utilized for? Mainly kept inside for statues, etc., or some gold was maybe spent to, uh, to feed people? Mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. Because, you know, we know that uh, some, um, some uh, religious people were trading mm -hmm. uh, overseas, they mm -hmm. were international merchants mm -hmm. in reality. Mm -hmm. yeah. So maybe some gold was. was uh, uh, kept inside clearly, yeah, and yeah. some was uh, maybe spent outside mm -hmm. uh, to, to import uh, quite yeah, a lot of goods yeah, yeah, that yeah, Egypt yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. needed. Mm -hmm. and I think in this, in this regard, we can immediately also uh, pinpoint the kind of diplomatic exchange between right. Egypt and the Near Eastern um, vassal states or kingdoms, Babylonia, Assyria, and the other um, states, um, city states in the region, because when we think that gold in Egypt is a state-owned property, I think it's also more indeed the state, namely Pharaoh mm -hmm. and his administration, that uses this, this gold as the diplomatic means of exchange. And we indeed are well aware of this um, interesting exchange of gold thanks to the Amarna letters, in the which, Amarna, right. in which um, uh, Amenhotep III on the one hand and also Akhenaten um, where we have the diplomatic correspondence of the Egyptian um, royal household with all the um, kingdoms um, mm. in the uh, ancient Near East, so in the Levant and in Syria, and in which we read about this envy of those states. They think Egypt is the most gold-rich country because sure. there is one, one phrase, one, one vessel king says, in Egypt, gold can be picked up like dust from the street, so send me more. Send me more. Mm -hmm. right. And um, there's also another um, textual reference in which um, one Bornaburiash, I think, um, complains that the predecessor of the king that he's currently um, writing sent him more gold. And he complains, why did you only send me only two send mines only, of gold only. now? Sure, it's nothing. Please send me more. Sure. And interestingly, he then also says, if you send me more, please let me know what I can send you in exchange. In exchange. And this is then indeed this diplomatic and state-run trade exchange at the highest level, where really the gold is a key player and factor that, 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 sure. that um, created and sustained this flow over the, over the decades. Right. Yeah. Uh, I would like now to talk about uh, maybe the really extraction of gold mm. and uh, the very poor conditions of the people that were yeah. miners, yeah. but they were very often slaves. I would not say slaves, I would say forced laborers. Uh, forced labor, the, maybe. The, yeah. the term slave in ancient Egypt has it's a different very, kind of right. um, meaning. meaning. Yeah. So um, it seems that, let's say, based on our evidence, mm. we as Egyptologists are used to more, say, forced laborers and less use the concept of, concept of slaves that is more known from the, let's say, Roman um, and 
um, a world, True. which is then a different kind but, of, but of, we of know possession that of the person or the possession of the labor force. Or the labor force, force the right, person. exactly. So. But you know, we know that uh, to, to, uh, to get gold, uh, you need uh, to have a lot of water. Mm -hmm. And very often in the desert, the water was uh, shared between uh, the labor force mm -hmm. and uh, the gold production and the scriba. And the donkeys, not to forget. And the donkeys the also, uh, because they also they <laughs> need to drink. <laughs> um, and uh, very often, you know, people were suffering very heavily uh, yeah. because you know they, they didn't get enough enough uh, yeah. enough water, yeah. mainly in the desert, mm. under the sun, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, the dilemma, per, uh, 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 not a personal dilemma, but uh, the natural dilemma for the scriba and uh, the people that were in charge of the mining, they had to choose uh, what to do. Keep in mind that very often they had uh, an order coming out from from uh, from, uh, from mm -hmm. a ride, the pharaoh, mm -hmm. saying, "I want you to give mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. a certain amount of gold." More or less. Maybe, yeah, but they were, let's say, tasked to lead this expedition and plan it accordingly so that it would mm -hmm. return successfully. But thankfully, there are two texts from the, from the New Kingdom, so the 19th dynasty. One is the famous um, stela of Seti I at mm -hmm. Wadi Kana, is in the uh, Wadi Mia temple, where the king himself um, um, is described in court, discussing with his officials. And he said it the, the, the first himself wants to make sure that the miners that are sent to the Wadi Baramiya in the region east of Edfu mm -hmm. to mine gold are properly um, treated. watered and treated. And he led uh, also a well being dug properly at the site so that there is um, water. Mm -hmm. But he also had a particular interest in this. Because it was the time when Seti I built his own um, um, funerary temple at Abydos. So all these gold workers that were tasked in the Wadi Baramiya to source and mine the gold, all this gold was supposed to immediately go to the building project of Abydos. So he had this direct interest in facilitating and um, supporting and provisioning, Helping. providing right. for this particular workforce. Then there's another famous text um, on the so-called Kuban Stila, now in Grenoble, that was found mm -hmm. in the fortress of Kuban that was built by Sesostus I at the mouth of the Wadi Alaki. And this is a text in which also the King Ramesses II is presented in an audience at Memphis and in which some of his administrators tell him in the region of Akita, which is the Wadi of Wadi Alaki, there is water is lacking. Mm. When we send our gold miners to the wadi with the donkeys, only a half of them returns because there is a lack of water. Lack of water. Sure. But Ramesses II says, okay, this is something that needs to change because he himself obviously is also interested in the constant flow of, of gold being sourced there. So he tasks his viceroy, um, Setnacht, uh, Hekanacht, sorry, to um, oversee the digging of a well in the mm -hmm. Wadi Alaki at Um Ashira, at the specific space or spot. And indeed, also in the text, it mentions a well is dug, and in several meters depth, water appears. Obviously, it is culturally um, um, considered as the deed of God and of Ramses II himself in sure. choosing this spot. So he, as a, of a, of a godlike king, is god -like king is the one who made this, this water appearing. It seems also that particularly in the Wadi Alaki, there might even have been more wells all along um, the Wadi leading the wadi to the main um, site, campsite, where we then also have the um, habitation places of all the workers in the dry mm -hmm. stone huts um, that are marked with these kind of millstones. So we have also the toolkit of, of the uh, gold processing that indeed um, there is a system of wells, but in the Kuban Stila we also learned that um, water was sent with the workers in animal hides, sure, hides clear. to the mines. And since we are also here, let's say, not really close, but there might also be a constant flow of water, of goods, of provision between the mines and Kuban fort. Mm -hmm. So donkeys from Kuban were sending water, food, fuel and other things sure. to the mines and, bring back. and in return you know all the gold dust that sure. this has been produced 
is being sent back to Kuban, and then only at Kuban is being melted into ingots and is then sure. sent to the treasury of So Florida. you would say that mm. probably during the Egyptian time, the conditions of workers were a shade better versus the Roman time. This is indeed, you are mentioning the perfect example. It's the question, do we read Agatashides right. as, um, or do we, when we read Agatashides, do we read him as, um, as a testimony of this well, Greek It is a real, a real photographer or... Uh, or can we also methodologically, let's say, think about the same working conditions in, in the ancient times? I completely agree with you that working conditions in those mines were far from, far from no. ideal. Uh, this was, this was not, sure. not, not a relaxing life because this was a life constantly under the pressure of working, of hammering, of dust, of dirt, of, of noise, of people running, shouting, activity. So we also no. need to think and also a little bit about uh, something the that is very bad lived is, experience, is, um, yeah. is, uh, health conditions, yeah, right, exactly. kind of. And uh, no. imagine where, where no. he, when you dig, they had a the light that was in reality burning oxygen. Yes. And so people were suffering quite mm -hmm. a lot of mm -hmm. troubles in the mm -hmm. respiration yeah. and it was, it was a very bad condition. This uh, is then also a very interesting question, whether the fuel used in mm. these mining sites is locally cut wood or is wood that is also of any kind of fuel that is sent to the mines. Mm -hmm. Next to the use of wood, fresh wood, there might be the use of charcoal, you mentioned it charcoal, earlier. Right. And then it seems also that dried donkey dung is a possible for example, use, absolutely. Uh, is a possible resource for uh, kind of fire. A poor one because it's not uh, is not a very good production of uh, of energy, no, but, but it works. It works. It also then depends in which context you you sure. need the the uh, the um, fire, because the idea has also been um, pronounced that also in those underground mines, mm -hmm. also fire setting was um, practiced in order to set fire to the face of the stone in right, order to stone, yeah. break it loose after after um, um, cool, cool, cool water um, on it. But I'm, I'm skeptical because we don't really have that much evidence. Sure. I'm more into in favor of proper Egyptian handiwork with dolerite hammers and stone hammers really crashing sure. and these quartz veins both in the underground, both in the um, sure. and the hammers mines. who are mainly um, uh, what, uh, uh, copper or uh, bronze or... Uh per wonderful question. We know of, um, from the archaeological um, evidence that uh, was also particularly... Uh, heavy, heavy stones. Co uh, uh, ...collected by the, um, by the couple Rosemarie and Dietrich Klemm from, from Munich. Mm -hmm. They did this um, survey in the Eastern Desert and also Nubia. And they found these, um, that, that long and that wide dolerite um, hammer, so of a particular sure. type of, of hard stone that we also know was used in Egyptian stone quarries to, to pulverize the stone. And next to this, it seems that also the use of copper alloy chisels, meaning bronze chisels in the New right. Kingdom, right. might have been used. Yeah, but at that time, um, iron was not, was not, not, yet, not, yet, not yet present. Not yet available, right, no, exactly. No, iron is then only, has only been properly introduced in the Persian period, so. Right. No. Exactly. And this is then the, the, the interesting um, context also in terms of economy. So how much resources does the Egyptian state need to spend to send such an expedition, so such a proper state-run sure. expedition that is properly planned, in which 100 to 1,000 or even more people participate to these kind of locations in the eastern desert or the... Or the um, well, so it is really a, an investment, this like, like, huge like investment the, the, in, in the this companies way. Right, right now, yeah. they have to choose the same, yeah. how much do I want to spend, and I am not so sure to get all the gold I hope to, to get. Yes, yes. So yes, it is, yes, it is yes, a yes. risky activity, yeah. right? And then also the question is then maybe the Egyptian mindset was, f was potentially also not so much looking for economic benefit, mm. so it was not we spent that much resources, and we need to get that much money or gold back because the significance of gold was different. It was, has a diff, had a different kind of use context in, 
in ritual, in magical, in temple context. So it doesn't, didn't really need to be economically balanced. So the money you spend is something that you need to um, get in return get in, in the return, investment. Right. Because as I said earlier, I think that the backbone of Egyptian economy is the agriculture. And if, if this, this works, Still. then everything, right. everything is, let's say, our secondary dimensions of how this, how this state um, um, handled its economy. Sure. And the Nile was a, a really <laughs> the key element yes, once, the once key more. Element, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But the, yeah, the conditions of the work people in these mines were harsh. And you also mentioned the um, question of fuel. I mentioned the potential use of donkey dunks also in this context. And also, I want to add another, let's say, group of people, namely the local people living in this region. Mm -hmm. So the, what we are used to call nomads or the Beja people, the Blemis. So all those people who um, populated those um, desert regions they seem to be the people who had the knowledge about the landscape. Sure. So once the Egyptians could cooperate with them, they could then show them around. And they may be also in those periods during which Egypt didn't have territorial control or proper state control over those regions, were continuing with the gold processing and gold, gold mm. sourcing and processing. So on the one hand, we know Old Kingdom individual expeditions into the Eastern Desert, in the Middle Kingdom as well, the Middle Kingdom, and also with the fortresses, the chain of fortresses um, at the Second Cataract, so with the interest of the Middle Kingdom state in resources from, from Nubia, among them gold, and then with the New Kingdom proper political control and colonization of this region, also in bad terms. Um, but in those intermediate periods, these regions were not under the control of sure. Egypt. Big question mark in reality. And since there were people living there, it seems that they also then continued with um, mm. maybe smaller scale gold extraction. But um, Sure. Also. And I have a, a question. Uh, you know, uh, you have a very important map of the gold mines. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Is, uh, is it... Uh, According to me, it is the only one existing. Yeah. And do you have any idea whether there are other potential uh, that uh, are still missing? Or, uh, so it is the only one, or you think that probably they had other, other yes, probably I'm, other? I, I'm convinced that they had a huge set of maps. Sure. I think the Turin gold mine papyrus is the only one the surviving. The only one known and surviving. But right. the fact that this kind of topographical map that shows the Wadi Hammamat and the particular um, area about the Wadi Sid with the stealer of Seti II, mm -hmm. a well dug next to it, the indicated workman settlement, and then also these um, darker hills in which it says hills in which gold and silver are sourced or washed. So there is indeed so much also knowledge in terms of how to map, how to... Um, conceptualize so they had some experience. such a landscape and I think these kind of maps on the one hand were maybe the result of these cementio, the, the, those prospectors sure. that we know that particularly were we know more from the old and middle kingdoms in the epigraphic record that were sent out to the desert in order to find mm. those viable uh, quartz veins but I'm sure there was also a map of the whole Wadi Hammamat, because these are only parts, and also of the Wadi Baramiya, of the Wadi Alaki, of the Wadi Gabgaba, also maybe of the proper gold of Kush region, of so Kush, all the, Kush, the region sure. um, close to the um, New Kingdom pharaonic foundations, such as Sai, Solib, Tombos, Amara West, so this region mm -hmm. in which, by the way, also gold sourcing and extracting is a little bit simpler, because there the Pre-Cambrian basement complex and all the gold-bearing quartz veins and all the eroded um, quartz lying on the surface so, is far closer to the Nile, so there is less um, expenditure and necessary in order to. Um, so, to and I haven't seen uh, the map, but uh, do they indicate the different kind of gold? That means uh, I don't think. Right. No, not not in this map because it mm. says only this is the place of Neb, and it's the Juwab, it's the pure mountain. 
Rescue Mountain. Sorry. But um, which is a general term also for a religiously significant space or spot mm. in ancient Egypt, but not necessarily um, only related to gold. But this little thing triggers to only briefly come back to the three gold qualities that are right. known, since you mentioned it. There is a Nebu Nefe, so a good or perfect gold. Mm -hmm. There is a simple Nebu gold. And then there's the Nebu Hedge, so the bright or white gold. And this the is the whiter one. The whiter so silver, gold. More so silver. these are then, True. let's say, terms that seem to allow us to understand a little bit more how the ancient Egyptians themselves um, differentiated between the gold qualities. Because nowadays we can use modern methods of analysis. Sure. We know about the exact percentage of right. gold, silver, copper, and all the other kind of um, elements sure. inside. So I would like to just to, to conclude and, uh, and uh, remind of the fact that Nubia and the uh, eastern part of Nubia, between Nubia and, and uh, the Red Sea, were at that time probably the major gold producer of the world, known world at that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, this is something that uh, really I am still thinking when I am looking to, to the gold uh, I have on my fingers. And this may come from that period, maybe, I don't know. We know that gold is a very stable. And um, we know that the total amount of gold in the world right now, it is something like 102,000 tons of gold uh, that was dig, dug uh, in the past. Um, and uh, gold is very stable. So, you know, you can't throw gold out, out of the window, yes, but someone will collect it or maybe 20 centuries after it will be still used. Yeah. So, you know, Nubia uh, is a um, very, very important uh, element uh, in, in the histo economic history. Yeah. And I'm sure that you have m much more information than I have. Yeah, and speaking also about gold and the stable and the value and mm. the magical appeal of gold, we didn't really speak about no. the color, the gold, the shininess, and indeed also the stableness of gold, which, right. which, the physical. which is part of this kind right. of... Um, or mystery. Fascination <laughs> or interest of pharaonic culture in the use of gold, particular for these elite settings, for the kings, for, for royal statues, because as you are well aware, the Egyptians considered gold the flesh of the, the flesh gods of, uh, and silver right. the bones of the gods. So there is right. always this magical um, attraction. attraction or significance behind but gold. But this is still, I'm sorry to remind you, that the central banks right now own something like uh, 35,000 tons of gold mm -hmm. in the vaults. Mm -hmm. So still valid right yeah, now. Yeah. It's, yeah. So 4,000 years after. Mm -hmm. But this is then gold that is kept in the banks, in right. the vaults. And the gold in Egypt had a particular way of being used and shown and displayed. Right. Maybe less so in, the terms, in terms of the um, treasure of Tutankhamun, because all the gold sure. that he was equipped with was made in the um, workshop of the Karnak temple, mm -hmm. maybe, because the temple was the place in which all the gold was collected, was collected. and administered, mm -hmm. and where also the best artisans of their time were working. And um, with the tomb treasure of Tutankhamun, of the boy king Tutankhamun, we also see and understand what kind of um, cultural significance gold had, particularly in um, outfitting um, a dead king um, for the transformation into the afterlife or the um, maintenance and um, permanence in the afterlife. So all the gold in Tutankhamun's to, Tut -Am tomb plays this role of ritually and magically outfitting the king with all this kind of stable and um, um, magic power that gold provides. And since we also earlier mentioned a number of numbers or values, I want to remind that um, indeed the famous death mask of, um, sure. of Tutankhamun weighs 11 kilograms, so there's lots of gold it's involved. There are also gold. some precious stones, but let's say the main body of this object is 11 kilograms of gold, whereas the um, huge golden uh, sarcophagus um, weighs up to 110 kilograms hmm. of gold. And these are only two examples of far more gold or also gilt objects from, from the tomb of Tutankhamun, which again then brings us back 
to our main topic, so that the gold supported and helped Egypt in terms of economy, also in terms of its monumental display and in the use and, of and gold image, image. for all these indeed um, temple rituals, for the outfittings of, of the dead kings, because the tomb treasure of Tutankhamun is only the tomb treasure of Tutankhamun which survived. We need to imagine that all the other kings of the um, um, new kingdom were equipped with the same, the same or even larger amount even larger, maybe of, larger, of, right. of treasure. And so coming back to this question, how much gold was sourced in Nubia in the eastern desert and elsewhere and how much gold the state, the Egyptian state, then transformed into those funerary objects mm -hmm. that, so to say, it were meant to be cut off the circulation. There's a huge expenditure and, as we say, um, conspicuous consumption happening. Mm. It has been estimated that 12 to 18 tons of gold were um, produced during the whole New Kingdom, mm -hmm. which might seem a little bit small as an amount, but this is only what has been produced and it doesn't include all the gold that has been sourced and produced in the periods earlier. Right. And this is then also part of the appeal um, of the gold today that you mentioned in, in showing your, your, um, My ring. your finger mm -hmm. ring, because today, given the simple possibility of melting, remelting gold, and much of the gold from the other tombs of the kings was robbed and was remelted and right. found its way in different forms and formats and tools and statues and whatever, into the future circulation, which was not deposited in any tomb, but it's right. still then in circulation and might constitute some of the gold ingots that are currently in any kind of bank yeah. in the world, right. but might indeed also um, constitute maybe not the full share of your gold ring, but right. um, maybe. <laughs> um, a small part of it. And in this way, the gold of, of Egypt is still in a way or might still, still alive. be all around us and is still alive and therefore still creates this uh, fascination and um, attraction. Okay, vielen Dank. Vielen Dank, es war mir eine große Freude, <laughs> mit dir heute gesprochen zu haben. Danke.